Jacqueline West, uh, when you were designing the costumes of the Revenant, uh, tell us what kind of research that you did initially. Uh, I started with a conversation with Alejandro, and as soon as we were done speaking, I, I was in Lucca, Italy on vacation, and I didn't have a lot of my research um, books and uh, sources with me. So I called a friend of mine who I'd known for years who runs the Museum of the Fur Trade in Chadron, Nebraska. My husband and I have a small ranch in South Dakota, very close to where this bear attack took place. And I remember having visited this, her museum uh, several times with my husband. But what I remembered about our visit were that was that she had um, actual items from this period of time. And she had also, she curates the museum, but she also had compiled this incredible book with James Hansen with all of the furs that were used by the trappers, the fabrics that the Native women used to make their shirts, the, the moccasins. She actually had, um, which I didn't remember when I called her at first, she actually had Captain Henry's actual leggings from this expedition, mm. which she let me make a pattern off of and copy for uh, Donald Gleason. So she was a wealth, a wealth of information. And Jim Hansen, who owns the Museum of the Fur Trade in Chadron, Nebraska, actually became a consultant on the movie. The art department used her, the props department, uh, Alejandro invited him. Um, it, it was a it was an incredible thing that I happened to know her from these long road trips I would take from California to our place in South Dakota. Um, so that was one one part of my um, actual research. But it it kind of became um, a real challenge to to represent in clothing time and nature and experience. Um, and I did a wealth, a wealth of research. I looked at, I read journals. I read this amazing mm -hmm. book that Jack Fisk actually recommended to me called 40 Years a Fur Trapper. Um, I, as I said, visited the Museum of the Fur Trade as soon as I got home. I looked at drawings and paintings from the period. Uh, one trapper kept a journal of drawings where he actually sketched the wind, their little almost stick drawings and he actually sketched the trappers and the natives that they encountered. Um, I I read a lot of diaries. I read maybe six books that had been written about Hugh Glass, uh, historic um, accounts. Um, I it was it was just a, a comp, you know just a, a compilation of a lot of research. Bodmer, Catland, uh, uh, like I said, diaries, journals, all of that. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm so after you've done all that, um, you know, there's uh, there's designing the costumes, and then there's also designing costumes that look as if they've been uh, worn. Does that make sense? Um, and in the case of these characters, these are people who are out in the wild, out in the mud, out in the cold, um, and so their clothing is going to be affected by that. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes. Well, after that process, then you have to let your imagination take off. And for these characters that I couldn't find, you know, that weren't, you know, that were more fictional, like Stubby Bill and, and uh, Murphy and some of these other characters, I had to just let my imagination go and create backstories with histories of what part of the country they came from, maybe what they did before this and what clothes they would have brought with them that would then have been um, augmented by clothes the Native women traveling with the band would have made for them using skins and furs. Um, so that was a process. And then I had to, then there were the real characters like Jim Bridger, uh, who was an orphan from Kentucky who ended up a keelboat. Uh, uh, you know, he, he actually pulled the keelboats across the Missouri and signed on for a better life 
as a fur trapper, and he later became one of the most famous, if not the most famous mountain man in America. So because he was the, you know, kind of king who reigned on the Great Plains after this story, I gave him a buffalo coat as a symbol of that. For Fitzgerald, I, I, his symbol, symbolic animal was the otter, with the otter and the badger who are so clever and figure it out and, you know, work out how to survive. Um, for Hugh Glass, uh, he was more, he was in the wilderness for different reasons. He had a, a more spiritual take on the wilderness. That's why he gravitated towards the Native Americans. And his, he communed with animals. He used them only for food and for, um, and, and for warmth and the survive nature, which is kind of his cathedral out there, uh, together. He had, he was looking for something different than monetary gain in the wilderness. So I made his costume almost monk-like with the hoods and, and Alejandro loved that. I, the first thing I ever showed him was an Arikara warrior who's, uh, uh, it wasn't a warrior, I'm sorry, a Arikara hunter whose clothing mm-hmm resembled almost a capuchin monk and i kept that theme going um through the film but as far as the aging is i'd read a wonderful uh jack had given me a book early on called 40 years of fur trapper and i read that as these trappers came off the missouri after being two years out in one of these uh fur trapping expeditions for the American Fur Trade Company, that you couldn't tell what their clothes were made of. They were so greasy that you couldn't tell uh-huh. if they were wool or leather. So with my Ager Dyer, who was brilliant, um, Karen Durant, we came up with something that we felt would replicate that on leather. And to get even close, we had to start dyeing the hides into different colors. Um, you notice we gave... Uh, Hardy's Tom Hardy's character Fitzgerald a kind of greenish greenish tone which kind uh-huh. of worked for his character when we dyed the skins because some skins will tan that way depending you know what's used on them um, and then we uh, after that we aged them with this magical concoction she created that Alejandro loved so much, both Alejandro and Chivo, that we gave her the name on set, Walks with Black Wax. We gave her a native name (laughs) because Mm -hmm. black wax became this magical substance, which we aged all the clothes with to replicate that bear grease that the trappers actually used in that period to waterproof their clothes. So Mm -hmm. it was a big process that both was both dyeing and aging. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's also the uh, technical aspects of uh, filmmaking where you sometimes have to create multiple sets of the same thing for, um, you know, uh, for different scenes. And so can you talk a bit about that? Well, for Glass, for instance, before the bear attack, I think he had uh, maybe, oh, three versions. After the bear attack, there were 20 versions because there were all the things that happened to him in the actual bear attack. Then there was the blood aftermath. Then there was the reconstruction of the costume by his son, Hawk, sewing fur pieces in to keep him warm and stitching this totally tattered leather coat. Uh, It was patterned after a an English frock coat, of course, in that period, um, putting it all back together in a different way than it had originally been constructed by very rudely, crudely stitching it back up, adding fur pieces to keep him alive and warm. So there were stages of that. It was, uh, as his costume had accumulated, it, it deconstructed right on camera. And as he became more and more mobile he you know we had him actually 
there were actually scenes shot that I didn't make it into the film of him sewing fur pieces into his costume. There is a scene in the movie where his son sews uh, rabbit fur into his hood, his wool hood, and um, Jim Bridger puts it on him in a scene just to keep his head warm through the night. So there were many versions. I'd say 20. He had 20 versions with multiples within that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, You know, what's really interesting about the, you you talked earlier about, uh, you know, the different animal symbols for the characters. You know, I I think it's interesting that you look in costumes, not just in terms of, like, what people would have worn during the period, but from a metaphorical standpoint, if that makes sense. Oh, yes. In fact, I use that word. Uh, the night before last uh, in a uh, Q&A I did with Alejandro and Leo Alejandro is a really metaphorical director he relies on metaphor to the entire movie and and he drove me to do the same thing Um, you know all these costumes were in collaborations with Alejandro Um, first I would do an initial run of drawings with some choices for him of ideas I had. And then he responds very viscerally to things. He His body language changes when he sees something that really sings to him. So it was a huge collaboration. And he'd, you know, pick one of these, uh, ren- you know, rendered drawings. And then I would make it up and age it and sometimes put it on a fit model and show him and we'd talk about it and talk about how then when the actors came, we camera tested these clothes on the actors in the environment to see if he got the feeling and the mood and the philosophy of that character that he felt their past experience evoked for them, so mm-hmm. evoked for him. So it was it was quite a process. That's why it took a year. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, you've worked on so many great films and with so many great filmmakers. I wonder, uh, you know, as you go from film to film, what do you learn that you uh, bring you on to the next project? Well, you learn something on every film you do because um, I try to be really character-driven and dress mm-hmm. people from the inside out. And to do that, you really have to research the times. It's really like taking – it's it's quite modern, the film process. I I was once a fashion designer, but it it comes from taking that character shopping in that time, but relying on that character to pick only certain things. Once you find the character, they kind of dress themselves because you learn what was available to them, what they're – background was both economically and um and philosophically and then you they would only pick certain things like i counted on these characters to kind of pick the animals they would want to represent them as they became more animal like animal ridden as they got colder and colder and progressed to the fort so um you you learn you 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 study the history of that period, and you study a lot of different uh, economic, you, the social structure, the availability. It was like when I did the New World, I had to see what what um, what metals were available. You know, there weren't beads for the natives in these periods. You know, it wasn't a lot of trading of that kind of stuff that becomes kind of cliche plains Indian or. East Coast Indian, you have to really figure out. So it becomes a huge study. You immerse yourself in that period. So you learn uh, so much stuff about the period you never knew. But a film is like time travel when you're working with a good director. And they immerse you. You feel like when you walk on the set, when you're working with somebody really good, that you have gone back in time. And you feel what it was like to live then, the hardship, the grittiness, the or the beauty, or the fabulous fabrics, or the smelly leathers, or you can almost walk onto a set and smell it. And so it is like time travel. So I feel I'm one of the 
I was an art historian, so I feel I'm one of the luckiest women in the world that I get to experience that with really good directors on fabulous sets with wonderful production designers and great actors. So I'm I'm kind of the one of the lucky ones in this business and I and I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much and congratulations on the film. Really excellent work. Oh, thank you so much. It was nice talking to you, Zach.